Now in today's lesson, we're going to be going over the prophet Daniel. In the book of Ezekiel, a contemporary prophet during the time of Daniel, Ezekiel was preaching in Babylon while Jeremiah was preaching in Jerusalem. And Daniel, he was beginning to come up in the upper echelons of Babylon to give the people of God power over Babylon. It was just amazing, but we'll get into that as we go along. But the Lord rebukes the king of Tyre in a mocking fashion by stating this, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee, mentioning Daniel. Of all the other people that could be mentioned, Daniel is pointed out for wisdom. The old Bible commentator Joseph Benson noted this, The fame of Daniel's wisdom was so quickly spread over the Babylonian Empire upon his being advanced to several posts of honor and dignity by Nebuchadnezzar. And again does the Lord himself mention Daniel and Ezekiel, though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, meaning the city of Jerusalem. Even if they three were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. Meaning these men are so high up in God's eyes, so revered in heaven, that by that point, even if they prayed for the city of Jerusalem to be saved from Nebuchadnezzar, God would only save them. Just so you all know, our ministry has went over every single verse of the 12 chapters of this Old Testament book of Daniel. So if you all would like to... Search for those. Feel free. Now, right here's a list of the books of the Bible. And as you'll see to the left, you have the 39 books of the Old Testament. And you'll notice how it's broken down into four sections, but essentially five, with the beginning of the books of Moses, the law, then the histories, then wisdom from Job to the Song of Solomon. And then you come to the major prophets, in which you'll see Daniel noted for being the last of these major prophets. The very first words of the book of Daniel begin like this, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. Now, as one can tell from this chart, Jehoiakim was the third from the final king before Nebuchadnezzar ultimately took and destroyed Jerusalem. And Daniel notes how it was in the third year of Jehoiakim, out of his 11-year reign, it was in his third year that Nebuchadnezzar first invaded Jerusalem. Now, this would be the first of three deportations which would make up the Babylonian captivity, beginning in 605 B.C. It was around that time that the prophet Jeremiah, he had probably the most difficult of all the jobs of the preachers and prophets back then, because he had to stay in Jerusalem and preach to these very hard-hearted people. And he was preaching this, For thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you, and perform my good word toward you, in causing you to return to this place. So seventy years you all will dwell in Babylon. And it shall come to pass, when seventy years are accomplished, or completed, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans, and will make it perpetual desolations. So after 70 years, then I'll punish them for their cruelty towards you all. Once again, the first stage of the Babylonian captivity would occur in 605 B.C., three years into the reign of Jehoiakim, just as noted in the very first verse of this book of Daniel. So the very first captivity would begin in 605 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, would first invade Judah. Right here's a list of the nearly 20-year time frame that it would take to ultimately destroy the city of Jerusalem. And once again, as we can see why Daniel points it out, it's because in the very first year of 605 B.C., which began the 70 years of captivity, it would begin in 605 B.C., and the reason why it's noted by Daniel is because it would be Daniel and others, like that of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and all of these, they would be taken into Babylon that year. Now let's go on to the second verse, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God some of the vessels from that of Solomon's temple, 
did Nebuchadnezzar take, and the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar then ordered the captive youths to partake in the specially offered meat and wine for three years before appearing before him. Daniel then requests, because he had gained favor, Daniel, which believed, was around 15 to 17 years old. We know that he was a young man, but he was probably near the age of 20. But Daniel then requests that they not be forced to partake of the meat and wine offered by the king, but rather be given vegetables and water. The prince who had authority over them worried that if they appeared malnourished before the king, he himself would be sorely punished. It would then be that after a 10-day test suggested by Daniel, after a 10-day test of allowing the Hebrew youths to only eat vegetables and drink water, the prince was convinced their own diet would suffice. Verse 17 then goes on to tell us, As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king, meaning as counselors among him. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. This was very important because they believed that the gods revealed these signs unto the magicians, astrologers. So the God of the Hebrew people, the God of the Jews, that would be the one exalted in the eyes of this greatest of all nations at that time. Verse 21 then notes, And Daniel even continued until the first year of King Cyrus, which would be some 70 years later. It would be in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, as denoted in chapter 2 of the book of Daniel. It would be in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign that the king of Babylon had a dream. Nebuchadnezzar would dream of a large statue made up of differing elements, gold, silver, etc., Nebuchadnezzar then awoke and called all his sorcerers, magicians, and astrologers unto him. Verse 4 in the second chapter then tells us, Then spake the Chaldeans, Babylonians, Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If you will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. But if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation thereof. The king answered and said, I know of certainty that you would gain the time, because ye see the thing is gone from me. He's meaning... You're stalling. He's not an idiot. Like, he's really wanting to know what's the interpretation of this. And he's almost played out as a skeptic right here in the narrative. You almost see a bit of a skeptic within Nebuchadnezzar. All of these things, you're all a bunch of fakes and everything like that. And hes it's almost like he's giving up on religion itself. This dream was so important to him. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that ye can show me the interpretation thereof. This is very difficult. Anyone can tell you a dream, and then you tell them some whatever you think about it. Anyone can do that. But to actually tell a person the dream itself? Very difficult. So this back and forth went on and on until Nebuchadnezzar does ultimately say, kill all the magicians, all the astrologers, all the sorcerers, 
And this would have included Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who word got around to after that. Then young Daniel went and told his friends to pray unto God for mercy, which God gave by showing Daniel the same dream as the king that night. Daniel then met with the king, telling him his dream and the interpretation. The dream featured a huge statue of a man whose splendor was excellent and its form was awesome. And the head of the statue was of gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Each section represented a kingdom, and the head of gold was one of those kingdoms of Babylon, ruled by Nebuchadnezzar himself. The second section, the chest and arms of silver, was to be a second inferior kingdom, which we are told in Daniel 5 was the Media persian Empire. The third kingdom, the belly and thighs of bronze, was Greece, ruled by Alexander the Great. And the fourth kingdom, the legs of iron, was undoubtedly Rome. The fifth kingdom, however, is the feet of iron and clay. And that is the kingdom that will be smashed by the rock, bringing down all the other kingdoms before it. Daniel 2, 34. Now, while opinions differ on who this last empire is, most Christians believe that this is to be the Antichrist kingdom, the final kingdom, which is spoken of in Revelation chapter 17, verses 12 and 13. Here, the Antichrist leads a coalition of 10 nations which is in verse 14, is defeated by Christ, who then sets up his eternal kingdom, where the kingdoms of the world become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Revelation 11:15. Now, for any of you in whom would like to watch our in-depth breakdown of this dream and interpretation, we do have a 20-minute video on that. Very much worth watching. But after Daniel tells the king all of this, we read in verse 46, then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. Now oblation, worship, and sweet odors were often what they did to gods. And this was such a striking display of divine inspiration that just as God set Moses up as a god unto Pharaoh back in the day, right here we see Daniel being exalted as a god in the eyes of even the king of Babylon. The king then promoted Daniel to being ruler over the whole province of Babylon and set his three friends over the affairs of Babylon. This was a huge thing that happens, which was exalting a believer in the true God, just as Joseph before him and Esther and Mordecai even later on. So God always seems to put people in whom love him in high positions of power. But this was particularly important because the Babylonian captivity has begun. And now suddenly in the second year that they get there, Daniel, one of the most godly of men, is promoted within this new Babylonian, neo-Babylonian empire. About seven years later, would Nebuchadnezzar invade Judah again in 597 B.C.? This would be the second of the three deportations. In 597 B.C., taking the prophet Ezekiel and others captive to Babylon. Some years later, many commentators estimating around the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign in 586 B.C., the same year of the third and final deportation of those taken captive from Judah to Babylon, the very instance when Jerusalem is destroyed, they believe that this account happened in the very same year. The king made a 90 feet tall image of gold. Some believe that Nebuchadnezzar did this in order to perhaps thwart the prophecy indicated within the dream Daniel had interpreted, as the image of gold correlated with the head of gold representing his kingdom within the very image that he saw within the dream. So Nebuchadnezzar builds this gigantic statue near Babylon. It's probably in the image of himself, just as the pharaohs and all of these would have built. And at the sound of music, we're all commanded to bow to the image. Any refusal would be met with death by being cast into a fiery furnace. We're told who the king of Babylon actually forced to come to worship this image. The audience was comprised especially of Babylon's greatest leaders, captains, princes, 
judges, the king's counselors, treasurers from all over the kingdom. So these were high up people. This was not just an audience of poor folks. This was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, everyone and whom was a ruler over the cities. They must be there. But Daniel, we believe he was away somewhere else being a high ranking ambassador within Babylon. Daniel was not present for this, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were. But remember, they were also promoted high up along with these others. Now, one must understand that in order to gather so many prominent people to one place, in order to bow to a statue, this was a humongous event. This would have been watched very, very carefully. And this was to demand the obedience from all of his people to see him no more as a king, but as a God upon the earth. Once again, this is the type of the Antichrist in the last days, how he'll have an image and it'll speak and it's probably AI and all of that's probably involved with it. It's also very striking how the number 666 can even be found within this third chapter of the book of Daniel. But there's 66, and then it's at the sound of six instruments named that they all bow to it. So right there we do see a kind of 666. So definitely a shadow of what the Antichrist is going to do, force every one of the leaders in the world to bow, especially all the people as well. But So the music rings out, these trumpets. And suddenly the only three that are now bowing are these Hebrew people. And you may be asking within your minds, well, were there other Jewish people? among the crowd that bowed to this statue, as far as we know, the only Jewish people that would have been there would have been Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because the audience was so comprised of the elite within the empire, and these captives, these slaves, would have not been exalted in the kingdom at that time. And also, there's something very telling in the fact that it's these three Jewish boys that are not bowing to this statue, because in the latter days, the Antichrist, he comes against the city of Jerusalem, and it's believed because they refused to bow to him. They were then, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were promptly brought before Nebuchadnezzar, who ordered that they be cast into the furnace. The king's most mighty men then are called, as we're told. The king's most mighty men then bound them and cast them into the furnace. They didn't just throw them in. No, they bound them, and they were cast in. And, I mean, this is just a horrifying scene, which was ordered to be made. The furnace was ordered to be made seven times hotter by that point. The heat alone killed the men who threw them in. It's then, after a few moments, that we read in verse 24, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counselors, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Now one should not pass up the nuance within that verse, my dear friends, because he says that this man, this fourth man, does not just look like a man, but the Son of God. Now that puts this fourth man on a godlike level. So Jesus, in the midst of the fire with these three Jewish men, he looked different. And I'm guessing that he had a bit of a glow to him because in a fire, you're not going to be able to see much at all. But a man glowing, you're going to be able to see. And that's basically going to be the only thing that's going to stand out. This was a searing fire, mind you. So I believe that it was really a bizarre sight to see. Nebuchadnezzar then called for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to come out, admitting their God was the Most High, praising the Lord in front of all his governors, princes, counselors, all of Babylon's great leaders. Incredibly significant. This would exalt the true God in the minds of these obvious pagans who just got through worshiping a statue. Now, all of a sudden, they're saying a true miracle, a true work of the true God. And this would have exalted God in the Babylonian Empire immediately. Verse 28 then goes on, Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. 
that every people, nation, and language which spake anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon even higher up. Shortly before his death in 562 B.C., as noted in the chapter 4 of the book of Daniel, shortly before his death in 562 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar was given another vision of a tree being cut down, signifying the consequences of the king if he were overtaken with pride. The king ultimately ignored the warning and was for seven years driven mad, only later to be restored upon giving glory to God. From 562 to 556 B.C., about six years, for the next six years, three Babylonian kings reigned, leading to their final king, Nabonidus. And Nabonidus would reign along with his son Belshazzar. He would reign right up until the time of the Persian invasion, which would be carried out by Cyrus the Great. It would be during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar that Daniel would be given the visions of chapter 7 in 552 B.C. and chapter 8 in the book of Daniel in 548 B.C. And once again, for any of you in whom would like our detailed breakdown of those two chapters, I highly recommend going and watching our Bible studies over them. Now, according to history, outside of that written in Scripture, that after conquering Tama, located in Arabia, Nebuchadnezzar would stay there in Tama for about a decade, not returning to Babylon until September or October of 543 or 542 BC. While there in Tama, Nebuchadnezzar's son Belshazzar would become the regent of Babylon, gaining power which he would maintain until 539 BC in the invasion of Cyrus and Darius. It would be in the final year of Nebuchadnezzar and his son Belshazzar's reign in 539 B.C. that Belshazzar would make a great feast, according to the fifth chapter of the book of Daniel. Belshazzar would make a great feast for a thousand of his lords in Babylon. During the feast, Belshazzar ordered the vessels his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Solomon's temple be brought out, and from them he and his guests drank wine while praising their false gods. Unbeknownst to Belshazzar, the forces of the Persian king Cyrus, along with his ally Darius the Mede, were secretly infiltrating Babylon at that very moment. No one really thought that Babylon, the city itself, could be conquered, but the way in which the Persians themselves even recorded it, the city was taken without a fight. Daniel 5.5 5 then goes on to tell us this, that in the same hour that Belshazzar and Make note that it says with a thousand of his lords. So this is with the rulers, which would be the representatives of all of Babylon. They're all partaking in this blasphemy unto God. It's not just Belshazzar that's doing this. It's all the Babylonian representatives, the thousand lords that are there with him. They're all praising these false gods. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and rode over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one against another. His bowels were loosened, he messed himself. Eventually, after many inquiries of what does this thing mean that's written on the wall, and this is where we get the expression, the handwriting on the wall, how something is made very obvious and plain to someone, this message. Eventually, the prophet Daniel, who would have been around 80 years old at that time, came forth to interpret the writing. Verses 25 through 28 in the fifth chapter of Daniel then go on to tell us what was written and the meaning thereof. And this is the writing that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Eparsin. God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Thou art weighed in the balances, and art found wanting. Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. That was the message that God had for this king of Babylon, Belshazzar. Now, I personally believe that the hand that was writing these words was the hand of Christ himself, the pre-incarnate Christ, the word of God as he would have been known at that time. But I believe that it was God himself writing upon that wall. As one does realize whenever he's reading the New Testament narrative of Jesus in Jerusalem, how he leans down and he begins to write something on the ground with his fingers. So 
The Lord's not beyond just writing something with his finger. We don't know what he was writing, by the way, but he was writing something on the ground. Daniel 5.29 then goes on. Then commanded Belshazzar, after Daniel had told him the interpretation of these words, then commanded Belshazzar that they clothe Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. Nebonidus, his father being the first, Belshazzar the second, and Daniel the third. In that very night, however, was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, Babylonians, was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. And Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. King Cyrus of Persia would then make his ally, King Darius of Medea, viceroy over Babylon. Then Darius, as we're told in the sixth chapter of the book of Daniel, then Darius set 120 princes over the kingdom, and over them he set three presidents, Daniel being the first and most prominent among all of them. It seems like God does this, even with Joseph. He immediately just exalts men within these kingdoms. And it was out of this high up exaltation of Daniel. Now, once again, Daniel, he's an old man at this point, quite different from his youth back in the days of Nebuchadnezzar. But he's once again, he's made a very prominent old ruler within the Persian Empire. Then did the princes and rulers conspire together against Daniel, finding no fault in him. And truly, outside of Christ, throughout the entirety of the Bible, Daniel is one of the very few outside of Joseph, Samuel, Josiah. Daniel is one of the very few that nothing negative is really recorded about him. They, the conspirators, they therefore decided to use his piety against him requesting of King Darius that a decree be made that no one be permitted to make a petition or prayer to any god or man for 30 days except to the king. You can only call to the king for your favors and petitions. Whosoever disobeyed the command would be condemned to death by being thrown into the den of lions. The decree, as we all know, did nothing to deter the old prophet. Daniel continued to pray three times a day as he did before. When Darius was told of this, however, his heart was pained for Daniel, causing him to go about attempting to find a solution to the predicament to no avail. He suddenly found the fault within this law. How there were truly a people within the Persian Empire that would refuse, even unto death, they would refuse to worship anyone except for God. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel, and cast him into the den of lions, now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. So even Darius, we see right here, he's even attempting to find hope in the true God. Daniel was then cast into this den of lions. Now, mind you, there was a lid placed over this, so there wouldn't have been a light shining down like this. This would have been a very dark place, and it's meant for punishment. There was actually a man back in the early 90s named the prophet Daniel Abeldunran, and he actually attempted to recreate this same miracle, claiming that the God of yesterday is the same as today and forever. He entered into this lion's cage within this zoo located within Nigeria at the time, and this was 1991, but it, he went to this zoo, found these lions, he walked in with this red robe, claiming, you know, citing all of these Bible verses, Isaiah and all of these. He then walked in, and at first, the lions fled away, startled by what's actually going on. They're in shock as well. So the lions, they flee away. He walks up to them, and there's this death stare going on between them. And there, there's an audience watching. Then, in a flash, the lions lifted their massive bodies and charged at Abeldunran. The Bible flew away, and he landed with a thud. A bitter struggle ensued, and the terrified crowd could not believe the scene before their eyes. It seemed everyone was too confused or fixated to even do anything. The pastor could not believe his eyes, and as the lions landed on him, the look of terror in his eyes could only be better imagined. In a matter of seconds, he was torn to shreds, he died on the spot, and the lions snacked on his remains. And right here is an actual image of this Pastor Daniel in whom tried to recreate this. You know, the Bible says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Daniel in the Bible, he did not willingly go into this den of lions tempting God to save him. He didn't do that. This was a merciful act by the Lord. 
Daniel 6.18 then goes on to tell us, Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel, and hath shut the lions' mouths, that they have not hurt me, for as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no harm. Darius then ordered Daniel to be brought out, and his conspirators cast into the den of lions. Then King Darius wrote unto all the people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and steadfast forever, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth, and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. And as we see, don't get so close-minded when reading scripture. Because you'll come up upon these times where the true God is exalted among all the nations of the people. God has always made himself known among the Gentile nations. It would also be in the same year, 539 B.C., that Daniel's chapter 9 was written. And if all of you are interested in watching our breakdown of this Daniel 9 study, it, it contains the 70 weeks prophecy. Very fascinating. I actually believe that I have a clip of Chuck Misler within that, breaking it down as only he could. It would be in the third year of Cyrus the Great, King of Persia, in 536 BC, that chapters 10 through 12, the very end of the book of Daniel, were written. In 536 BC, as we're told. It would be then, towards the end of his life, that Daniel would encounter angelic beings and be told certain details concerning their warfare with the demonic realm. And once again, we have a breakdown of every single one of those verses as well, from chapter 10 all the way down to chapter 12. It took me so long to make Daniel 11, and Daniel 11 is really the most controversial of all the chapters of the book of Daniel because it details the times of Alexander and after Alexander and the Seleucid Empire, and it really gets so detailed within it. Even speaking of Antiochus Epiphanes, in whom I label as the Old Testament Antichrist, basically. He's the most evil man outside of the Antichrist himself, but I highly recommend it. took me so long to put Daniel 11 together. However, it would be in chapter 12 that we find one of the most mysterious cases. It's actually a very short chapter, and it's in this final chapter, chapter 12 of the book of Daniel, where he records the prophet's encounter with a man standing upon water with two angels on each side of the banks. The angels themselves, as we're told by the prophet Daniel, the angels themselves even inquire of the man upon the water as to the end of days being told to Daniel. So obviously this man walking on water, if you will, he's very important. The man is beyond any shadow of a doubt among basically all commentators, beyond any shadow of a doubt, the pre-incarnate Christ. So it isn't just in the New Testament that Jesus walked on water. He's always been able to do that, okay? So, <laughs> though we do not know how Daniel died, we do know that he likely lived to an age close to mid-80s or 90s. And that, my friends, is the recorded count on the life of this excellent prophet, Daniel.